Hello everyone, Ranger William here from the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail with another episode of Trail Talk, where we're trying to get to the stories behind the story of the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail, the Overmountain Settlements, and the American Frontier. Now, life in the American Revolution was not all military and warfare. Uh, life continued. People were married, families moved west, and people had fun. Now, one popular pastime in the 18th century was music. So to learn more about music on the frontier during the American Revolution, we are joined by brothers Noah, Joshua, and Daniel Smith, also known as Sons of Liberty, a musical trio specializing in early American music. Now, all three of the brothers are classically trained violinists for um, going on 12 years now, and for the last eight years have been heavily involved in living history and the study of early American music, if you haven't guessed from their clothing. Now, they're all trained on the violin, but also they've branched out into other popular 18th century musical instruments like the cello, the viola, and uh, as a group, the Sons of Liberty roughly perform about 200 performances uh, annually throughout the Middle and Southern colonies, as they put it, and they currently have two albums out with their music. So, the Smith Brothers, thank you guys for joining us. It's great to be here. Thank you very much. Um, so to kind of jump into this and start out, the the concept of, okay, we're talking about music. That is a major topic to try and dive into. So kind of just to, to break it down, um, when we're talking about musical instruments in the later 18th century, are there a few that are kind of common across the spectrum of different uh, social classes, different styles of music? Or is there going to be a heavy variation, a very divided line between what instruments you would see in different social structures or different cultures? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. And um, so to look at this, um, going into the 18th century, there are a lot of musical instruments out there. But there's one in particular that really transcends both uh, social class and musical style. And that is the violin otherwise known as the fiddle. So um, if you look at the music of the 18th century, it can be divided into uh, classical music and uh, traditional music, which back then was the, the fiddle music of the Scots and the Irish and the English, and also how the violin was used in terms of by the gentry or by the common folk. So the violin bridged those barriers by being able to be uh, incorporated into an orchestra, a, um, a chamber ensemble like in the big cities of Boston or Williamsburg, as well as being a solo instrument out here on the frontier, playing for the enjoyment of the colonists as they're sitting around campfires or something like that. So um, now there are some other instruments out there. I know you're talking about the range of instruments. So I want to brush up on those a little bit. Um, now there are some misconceptions about musical instruments that um, out on the frontier, like the hammered dulcimer, the banjo, and the mandolin. So let me just go ahead and talk about those a little bit one by one. So the mandolin first. So mandolin is plays an integral role now in a lot of bluegrass music. However, in the 18th century, it was still in vogue. It had just been invented in 1720s. It was mainly an Italian instrument at that time. And uh, just women were allowed to play it. Um, now the hammered dulcimer, it's often associated with Appalachian and bluegrass music. But in the 18th century, there are very few of them around and still not really carried over into the frontier areas because with so many strings and all that, it's hard enough to keep four violin strings tuned from personal experience and all different kinds of weather and all that, much less 30 something. It's also very bulky. So right. um, it's the violin really uh, made it to the frontier as the only instrument to really be practically used out there. Now, the banjo. Um, also, uh, integral part of um, traditional uh, bluegrass music and all. In the 18th century, that was just starting to come over. It came over with the slaves, actually. Thomas Jefferson actually had a record of what he called a banjer played at Poplar Forest, but not very popular until after the turn of the century. Right. I've seen some great images of things like like the, the banjer, the banza, these like early uh, West African, Afro-Caribbean instruments that people are saying, oh, it's such a crucial part of kind of American folk music, um, but they don't really know the story of how it got into there. So I'm glad you mentioned that. 
Um, so it seems like the, the violin, y'all's main instrument, is kind of that main common thread all the way throughout, or the common string, I guess you could say. Uh, now, I think you mentioned this uh, when we were talking previously a little bit. Um, do you think that with y'all taking violin lessons for so long, that is one of the main reasons you came to this point of music and history coming together? Like maybe if you had chosen a different instrument uh, early on, you would not have come to this point of history centric music? Well, I think definitely that would be, uh, a, you know, a, a good point for you to make. Like if, um, for instance, we played an instrument like the euphonium or the saxophone, definitely we wouldn't have gotten into historical music because obviously those instruments are, at least on a historical timeline, fairly recent invention. Um, now, if we played even, you know, one of the more uh, common woodwind instruments, such as the bassoon or maybe the oboe or the uh, English horn, we might have gotten into a little bit of historical music, but definitely not in the way that we have. It wouldn't, it would have been more about us, you know, playing music that would have been played during uh, specific historical times instead of actually getting in there and immersing ourselves in history in order to bring the music out. So I think definitely having uh, the violin as our primary instrument definitely spurred us along in some ways to get into it. Well, there's an idea for a third album, then. You can switch over to a bassoon trio and branch out. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> <It's hot. laughs> All right. Now, so moving on, we're talking a little bit about the, the cultures and the different influences. Because um, when you look at the American colonies in the mid-late 18th century, it is a, a massive mixing of different cultures. You have, like we just talked about, these African instruments, these Scottish instruments. Um, and there's all these other cultural aspects that are blending as well. But looking at musical traditions and instruments, um, is there a certain culture that you find kind of overwhelm the others when it comes to the more of the, the Western settlements, the frontier, when it comes to music? Is there more English influence, Scottish, uh, French? Uh, what do you find really popping out? Well, that's that's a really key question, I think, when we're trying to understand what happened to music in the uh, the 18th century and, you know, the turn of the 19th century. Um, and uh, so when we when we start to break that down, we've got to kind of look at where did everyone come from and where did they end up? And um, so really, uh, in the middle 1700s, we got, you know, the French and Indian War happening. And that was really the turning point for, you know, who went where. Mm -hmm. And uh, it kind of set boundary lines. Between different populations coming from different places in Europe. So if we look at the turn of the 1740s, 1750s, we've got a large Germanic influence coming into Pennsylvania. We've also got a lot of um, French Canadian influence that is um, emanating from Canada and from the upper colonies down into the lower colonies. So we see some influence in French music. But predominantly in the 1760s, when we have a large influx of the Scots and the Irish coming over primarily to fight in the French and Indian War, but also driven out by uh, famines and political unrest in their uh, native countries. We see a huge influx of that population moving into the American colonies. And uh, a lot of them came in either from Philadelphia or into Williamsburg uh, in that period of time. And so they sort of met out here on the frontier. We see two great waves of um, Scots and Irish population moving towards the frontier at that period of time. So um, predominantly um, by the end of the 1760s, most of the music being played uh, in the American colonies was of English or Scots-Irish origin. Uh, on the frontier, it was almost exclusively so because um, the population of the frontier at the time comprised mostly either purebred Scots purebred Irish or somewhat in between of that population. And definitely the music was coming from those people. Um, if you think about it also, the uh, the Scots and the Irish are a very musically uh, oriented culture. And um, a lot of the uh, history of those specific cultures came from music. So when they came over to the uh, United States uh, and um, headed toward the frontier, their music became uh, a guiding thread that brought them back to their heritage. Nice. Because like you're talking about um, 
Joshua with the, the, the hammer dulcimer, um, not exactly portable. So if you have a culture that does have some more portable instruments or uh, simply, um, what's the word I'm thinking of, uh, acapella, mouth music, um, and you're able to easily bring that with you, continue that culture, continue the stories and the history, you're going to see that kind of survive a little bit stronger. Um, so talking about, like you just said, with some kind of some stories, what do we know about music kind of fitting into daily life when it came to kind of the Western settlements? Um, was this something that was only going to be reserved for, you know, more like special occasions, holidays, celebrations, or was it like an everyday occurrence? Was this like an in the evening, around the hearth, um, you're going to hear music no matter what else is going on? Yeah, so um, that that is, I think, the big question here in terms of like, especially on the frontier, we got to think about the kind of people we've got in certain areas, right? So um, people who are going to be staying in the cities are going to be people who can afford to live in the city, just like today. Um, so uh, you've got upper class people who are staying in cities and um, upper class people aren't going to put so much stock in like, you know, the more, I guess they would call it coarse social interaction that went on in, uh, in uh, places in uh, the uh, frontiers in you know, Tennessee, Virginia, uh, South Carolina. And, uh, you know, they're going to have music as kind of just little background, maybe for dinner uh, to aid the digestion or uh, for a dance or just when they want to be entertained, bring out the music. You know? So um, that's different than on the frontier where, you know, it's kind of nice and lucky if your fort or your settlement or your traveling group has somebody who can sing or uh play a certain instrument they're gonna love that and um you know musicians were kind of associated with a higher class of society so if your fort had a musician or something that's a status symbol mm -hmm. um just to add to that a little bit i think we can find a good example of how these two intermingle um in period films like if you if you uh think about the uh, the movie pride and prejudice um we're looking at an upper class of society. And so, you know, in a couple of shots back and forth in the uh, the balls, you'll see a couple of scrolls from violins or, you know, hear the, the, the lilt of music. But in the earlier, the, the first ball scene in the movie, uh, you've got an entire gallery of musicians up there and it's very focused on the music while the dancing's happening. So you can kind of see the drift um, mm -hmm. between those two uh, kinds of music and the, the way they're being played for different uh, social class you know, we can really relate to that in our own experience because like when we're out there with y'all at calvin's for instance that uh really illustrates the frontier aspect of how music was um appreciated whereas if we're over at um like monticello or poplar forest when we're playing to provide background music for a social occasion of the higher class very different hmm it's really interesting that you point out how that's kind of something that y'all yourselves have experienced as 18th century style musicians. Um, okay, so kind of just to kind of recap real quick, we're looking at um, kind of the English, Scottish, and Irish being the predominant musical culture, but definitely being heavily influenced by um, some African, some German, some French influence. The violin tends to be that one kind of more common instrument that is available throughout some of these cultures, throughout some of these regions and settlements on the Western frontier. And we're looking at music being, I'm trying to think of how to, how to put it the best way, um, not necessarily more accessible, but maybe more appreciated on the Western settlements. Would you say that's Fair. Yeah, yeah. I, w I would. And, you know, because you got to think about it from the stance of, you know, city people are most likely going to be English people. They have you know, had access to the Scots and the Irish have a very social culture. You know, they want to sit down at night after a hard day of work with their good drinks, their good stories and, you know, music that they can talk about their culture. With. So I think that, re yeah, that really sums it up. Well, especially like y'all were saying, too, if you're having these Scottish musical traditions that are talking about s stories in their music and their songs 
And so it's not only going to be a nice entertaining thing, but it's going to be something that's maybe comforting or reminiscing. Um, definitely very, very social. Uh, yeah. That is great, great. Um, now, you're talking about a few different examples, like you all just have about um, where music fit into culture. What are some sources or records that we have that kind of tells us this? Like you were saying, okay, if you watch Pride and Prejudice, it's like, okay, so there's a, a modern example. But do we have any kind of journals or letters that kind of give us a little a little window into their opinion of music? That's a great question. Honestly, that question has fascinated me and it's really um, uh, helped me with my musical research into 18th century fiddle music, especially. But um, that question is a little bit hard to answer. And here's why. In the 18th century, in the early 18th century, the music that they were playing had been carried over from as early as the 1400s. Hmm. So and the other the other aspect of that part of things is when you um, take into account the uh, the culture of the time in terms of the Scots and the Irish and how they appreciated music, it was not something that they really did much to record. So since it played such an integral part in their culture, why even bother writing it down? Now, when you go to the turn of the century, about the 1790s, we have a few music books coming out. Um, good examples of those are Macintosh's three volumes of Scotch fiddle tunes, some of which he composed, but most of which he collected. Also, the Bunting collection of Scots and Irish fiddle music um, based off the last meeting of the Irish harpers, essentially the last true Irish um, musical convention. So with those two records, they were trying to preserve the music that they've been playing for a century and then centuries before. I think it's, it's a, an important distinction to make between the 18th and 19th centuries in a couple of ways. And first off is if you go forward just about 80, 90 years, uh, you have the Civil War happening. And in the Civil War, we have a massive amount of uh, record documenting what was being played in camps and during battles. And the reason for that a lot of times was that there was a large amount of new music being written specifically for the war. Whereas in the 18th century, a lot of the music was just simply being adapted from stuff that had been played earlier. Right. And also, I think a good point what you brought up about the Civil War is that um, we got to think about the people who are listening to the songs yeah. here because, you know, records are being made in the Civil War because I think a very important reason why we know more about that than you know, say earlier, that people could actually write. You know, we're talking about the common people um, writing down stuff. We're talking about, you know, fiddle music records. And the people who have enjoyed fiddle music most couldn't even write their name generally. And so writing that down, and like Joffa said, you know, uh, bringing up something that's so commonplace, you know, if you get up in the morning, you make breakfast, you don't write that down in your diary. You do that every day. So, I think that's some reason why we don't have this thing. Yeah, now the other thing is too, and a couple of people have brought this up when we had discussions about this, is we do have a couple of music collections, or at least music books, that have come out throughout the, uh, the earlier and middle 18th century. Um, for example, uh, Thomas D'Erfrey's 1720 book, Wit and Mirth, or uh, Phil's Bird Melancholy. And uh, there's an important thing to notice about these, and that is usually those were... Um, what we would think of now as high gloss uh, tabletop books that you'd have for conversation at dinner. And a lot of times they were um, more for reading and uh, for um, social interaction than they were for actual playing or documenting music. Mm -hmm. And fortunately enough, these still contain the tunes and the records that we need to uh, bring that back to actually performing the music where we can tell this was actually going on at the time. And it was at least being talked about. There's actually a small but interesting caveat to this as well. There's a, two music books in particular that came out as a result of the Revolutionary War. They didn't have anything to do with patriotic music. They were uh, one compiled by then Lieutenant George Bush, uh, aide de camp to George Washington. Um, he compiled 28 tunes just randomly while he's at Valley Forge. The same with um, Thomas Nixon Jr. Uh, also in the Continental Army, just compiling tunes that they heard. They're also musicians, just on their downtime. However, in retrospect, in terms of records, um, when we're out there playing at an event like at Calvin's, who would really be there to write down the events of that? 
On the other side, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington oftentimes recorded even down to the name of one of the songs that they heard that evening while they were at death. So you guys made some really great points there. Uh, like you just said, it depends a lot on the class of the person who's going to be leaving the record. And then, like um, like you were saying, Daniel, um, the, the literacy level, uh, which you do see greatly increase in the 19th century. Um, but then also just the commonality of the music. That's one of the great problems of historians and researchers is how do we know these little details? How can we find this? Um, and that's one of the great kind of jokes that there is, is like, you know, for historians today, what do you do when you get up? Just get on Facebook and go ahead and do a status about whatever it is that you're doing that day. Because in 200 years, someone will want to know and we have to leave a record for them. At least um, we have. So. <laughs> right. Uh, OK, so it, it's, it's a few records here and there. But then also, like you're saying, with the transition into the 19th century, once you finally start to see the loss of some of the culture, the loss of some of the songs, that's when you finally have that hindsight of, oh, we should probably be recording this. We should probably be writing this down before it's totally gone. And uh, talking about how the, some of the songs are just known, they're just adapted a little bit. I mean, how many different versions of songs of the same fiddle tune, you know? Like it's one of my favorite things to, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I know. A good example is I think when we were recording our first CD, you know, we were still kind of starting out, I guess. I don't know. But, you know, we compiled a list of our probably favorite ones to do at that point. We recorded them. Two weeks later, we were getting ready for the raid at Martin Station. We sat down and came up with a bunch of new arrangements. We were like, darn it, wish we could have recorded it now instead of two weeks ago. Yeah. So, you know, that's an interesting thing. Which version gets written down? It really just has to do with the time. Well, I think like, really quickly to add is that in the 18th century, we ha we were a nation of colonists. In the 19th century, we were Americans. So in the 18th century, we we're playing the music that we had brought over and compiled from the old country. Whereas in the 19th century, we were focused on making our own. Mm. That's a good point. That's a good point. Um, so we're kind of talking about that transition, though. It actually brings us right into the next question I had prepared for you guys. Um, I mean, art in general and, and music, it's a major reflection of society. It's like a little window into what matters to that society, what we're wanting to honor, remember, celebrate. Um, so how do we see music change? You just said that you start to see creation of more new American songs to go with this new identity. Um, but when you're looking right at kind of the revolutionary period, do we see any drastic changes? Do we see things uh, like certain songs getting banned? Do we see things that are just thrown out entirely because of their association with the British Empire? And is there anything new that gets introduced? Any kind of new trends, cultures, instruments, um, any kind of changes because of the revolution? Uh, that is a very interesting question. And, you know, you would expect that there'd be a lot of stuff being banned you know, because of the American Revolution. But we don't notice that really. And I think it's because of Joshua's point that, you know, we're playing British music, you know. And um, like I know I think brought this up a little earlier that, you know, we didn't write a ton of our own music back then. Instead, we adapted music that was made you know, from, from other cultures. And um, yeah, the, the, the other thing to notice too is that there have been a couple attempts throughout history to ban music. And the, the most current, the 18th century, would have been after the Second Jacobite Rebellion in 1745, when the uh, English government banned a lot of Scottish traditions, like the wearing of the clan tartan, or the playing of the bagpipes. And um, you would think that because of that, uh, a lot of Scottish music and tradition would be disappearing. But really what happened was people took off their kilts uh, they sewed that clan tartan into other garments. They um, took that music that was being played on the bagpipes and they learned how to play it on their fiddles. So really it's not disappearing, it's just morphing into a new form. And a lot of times too, uh, populations, especially in the colonies, were so radicalized for or against the king that if something were to get banned, you'd have half the population that didn't sing it already who would just start singing it because it had a political affiliation. So that's something to notice. And I think we can still see that happening a little bit today. 
you know, another point about um, quote patriotic music of the Americans um, was that we were using uh, British tunes. Also, our own, like Chester, for instance, was not a product of really people writing their own songs. It was a product of people putting prose verse written by um, politicians and uh, poets of the time to a common meter. You know, like we got um, yeah. John Dickinson's The Liberty Song, yeah. which was actually, uh, the, the tune for it was a uh, British patriotic song, and it still is called Heart of Oak about mm -hmm. the British Navy. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, like Josh was saying, most of the American patriotic music that we've got going on is basically adaptations of British patriotic songs. At, it's only until the 1790s when we actually started becoming a country that we decided, hey, we need some music for black. Yeah. Well, I mean, even, even our own national anthem, yeah. But even so, like with our national anthem, we're still using an old English drinking song for that. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, to a Nacron in heaven, uh, which is kind of really relevant now that you guys are mentioning this. When you're thinking of it that way, you're having British music being given American words the same way you're having British colonists given American titles. Um, it's that same kind of just changing the label, but kind of maintaining the the, the core, I guess you could say. Yeah, um, and that's, that's the great geopolitical shift that we see happening too, is that in the 18th century, like you're saying, we were keeping our British, our German, our French, our Scottish, or our Irish roots and calling ourselves Englishmen who wanted rights and separation from uh, the British nation. In the 19th century, we realized we're something different now. We want to have a new identity. Mm. So you guys have named a, a couple of the songs during this conversation, uh, Chester, the Liberty Song. Are there any others that kind of really kind of stand out as being heavily altered during the revolution or kind of rewritten during the revolution? Well, we've got um, a great example in the British Grenadiers, which uh, is still a popular march in England and is still used by the British military. And in the 18th century, uh, we uh, have words being written to that um, for a song called War in Washington by the Americans, which is actually pretty much a direct contradiction of the British lyrics to the same tune. So in performances, we love taking that one yeah. and pointing it out, just trying to show the, uh, the contrast between the two versions of actually the same song when they're pretty much contradicting each other. But we, we see a couple of those emerging. We've got Battle the yeah. Battle of the Kegs, which took Yankee Doodle. And even the tune Yankee Doodle itself, which um, was originally developed to mock the Americans. Um, and the Americans took it without even altering the words and just said, all right, you want to, you know, make fun of our style or whatever. You can do that. We're going to own it and say, you know, that's that's who we are. And this is the so style that's going to defeat you. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> it was actually played on Concord Bridge. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, so getting into the, let's see, the next question here, working my way down the list. Uh, we talked a lot about how music has changed. Um, we we're talking just now about how during the revolution in that time, you're using still kind of British tunes. You're just changing the words. Um, but we talked a lot about how music changes with the 19th century where you have the creation of new music, this new identity, um, not just changing some words around. Do we see anything in kind of any point in the 19th century, early, mid, but do we see anything that is written to especially remember the revolution um, yeah. or uh, the frontier? That's interesting because um, when we originally got into um, performing and doing uh, historical presentations for our performances, um, we decided we wanted to do a program about British and American patriotic music in the American Revolution. And we really went up against a wall because we thought we were going to get in there and find some original American songs from the 1700s. And it just didn't work out that way. Um, what we ended up doing is finding kind of what we talked about in the first uh, in the question before this. Um, we ended up finding a lot of adapted British songs for American purposes. Now. Uh, moving into the 19th century, like you're talking about, when we're again affirming that American and not British identity, um, we start to find commemorative tunes for a lot of things, but um, really not for specific events during the American Revolution. Um, I know, like, 
some there's some events of historical importance to us living out this area, like the Battle of Mountain, uh, the Battle of Calpins, uh, and a lot of those. Um, like during the 18th century, they weren't really known to the general population, but they mattered a lot to the people who were there and the people who were directly affected by the outcome. And that remained true for a lot of these events um, when they're being commemorated later. And it wasn't really until after the Civil War, uh, in, especially in the bicentennial in 1876, where we start to see commemoration starting. We, we get monuments, first for the Civil War, honestly, and then starting to get some of those also for the American Revolution when people are realizing we've been around for a while now, we need to start preserving what's happened. And um, so in that way, uh, a lot of the um, patriotic music that we see coming up might not have commemorated a specific event, but definitely the, uh, the themes of the American Revolution and the general idea of you know, what actually happened became popular as um, commemorative song during the 1870s, 1860s. Okay, because I mean, whenever you have a big anniversary, like I'm sure we're gonna be looking at that as we're coming up on the uh, 250th anniversary of the American Revolution happening. Um, big anniversaries are always big times of commemoration and remembrance. Um, so we've been talking all about their music back then and where how, how, how you guys can study it and instruments and influences. Um, for those who are maybe just wanting to hear some examples of that, uh, we mentioned that you guys have two albums out now, The Sons of Liberty. Um, are there any other kind of genres or musicians that, in your opinion, are kind of a good representation of late 18th century styles, uh, anything that maybe would have been popular or frequently heard on the American frontier in the colonies? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's an interesting question, and it's definitely something we like to look at. Um, when we're trying to find inspiration for what we do is just try to figure out what everybody else has done. And um, the problem we ran into a lot of times is that many groups who play early music uh, have the tendency to drift towards classical music and classical interpretations of the music. And or so, bluegrass yeah, yeah, exactly. And so um, typically uh, we'll find a lot of what we would term high Baroque interpretations of um, 18th century music. There are a few um, groups that drift towards the common people in their interpretations of the music, such as the uh, Hesperus Early, Early Music Ensemble, uh, the musicians de Saint Julien uh, in France, uh, who do a lot of um, uh, Scottish music. But again, they're playing it a lot of times in a high Baroque style with some classical influences. Although we do see, see some stylistic snaps that happen uh, throughout the recordings. Um, that's just something to keep in mind that a lot of times it would drift towards the classical music side of things. Um, and just that's just something to remember when you try to listen to uh, music is a lot of times during the 18th century, it would not have been nearly as precise or as diverse as the ensemble recording it. So what we did when we tried to figure out our interpretation of 18th century music is we tried to bridge the gap between the two styles of people taking uh, 18th century music and playing it uh, like modern country music or people taking 18th century music and playing it in a Baroque or classical fashion. And so we were trying to kind of hit the middle ground there uh, in between those two styles. And you also look at it too, um, especially like trying to portray frontier music. Uh, I think a big thing is that people try to make the ensemble too large. The larger the ensemble generally, the less likely we're going to have it be period correct because you know there are not a lot of people in the same place at the same time who can do the same thing so and the, the other thing is what we've tried to do is um look at the practicality of yeah. especially music on the frontier and this kind of goes back into the uh the question earlier about the musical instruments that would have been available on the frontier like a lot of times you see um like mandolins uh hammered dulcimers incorporated into playing uh, traditional fiddle tunes and everything, what we've tried to do is take it down to its bare minimum, what was most practical, what was most popular, and what was most available. Well, I don't need to play the cello a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Uh, throw that over a pack horse. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, thank you guys. This has been a ton of great information. 
Um, if anyone is wanting to really kind of dive in and learn more about early American music, um, are there maybe a few uh, books or resources you guys have found really resourceful? I know you mentioned those music books that you've come across, um, but is there more of like an introductory level kind of overview, anything that would be kind of useful? Well, there's a great book that we picked up a while ago at Colonial Williamsburg, um, which was kind of a survey of uh, 18th century music, and they had condensed it down to where it was the very simple melodies, and they'd taken it on a computer and, uh, you know, using what they call uh, MIDI technology, they'd uh, scored it so people could listen to it on a CD and play with it. Um, and it's called uh, A Modest Collection of, what is it, traditional? music of the 18th century and um you you can probably find that online or at colonial williamsburg that's a lot of um what got us started in 18th century music with just that book and looking through and also they have little uh write-ups about the history of each song in there so it proves very useful nice. now once you get a little bit more into the scholarly side of things pick up anything by uh kate van winkle keller because she is one of the great um musical historians of our time. And uh, so a lot of the inspiration we've got for programs and the music we play has come from her books, um, which uh, she had done an interpretation of the notebooks of uh, Captain George Bush and um, just some other common music of the 18th century. Yeah. So definitely look into that. So I want to thank you guys again for taking the time to, to sit with us and share this information all about 18th century music and the early American frontier. Um, and for those who didn't catch the intro, we've been talking with Joshua, Noah, and Daniel Smith, the Smith brothers, also known as Sons of Liberty. Uh, so guys, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Well, thank no you. problem. Thank, thank you. you so much. We really yeah. enjoyed it. And this has been another episode of Trail Talk. Uh, the whole idea of the series, trying to get to the stories behind the story of the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail, trying to better understand the Overmountain settlements in the American frontier. So thank you all for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed it.